everyone, and welcome to our fourth and penultimate webinar on managing weeds in an organic production system. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to spend with us. I'm Karen Claussen. I'm from the Manitoba Organic Alliance, or MOA. And in addition to hosting this series of webinars, we also produce a podcast called Grain on the Brain and run farm tours in the summer. So please check out our website at manitobaorganicalliance.com and you can find out a little bit more about us there. So our partner in bringing this webinar series to you is the Natural Systems Agriculture Group at the University of Manitoba. We have over 120 people registered to attend this webinar today. So welcome to everyone to Manitoba. You're all from across Canada and the States, so it's nice to have everyone here. We all have different climates, weeds, but we can hopefully um, apply the knowledge that we're gonna learn today to our different situations. Um, most of the webinars are hosted by staff and grad students in Dr. Martin Enz's research group. We'd like to thank our sponsors who have made this extension work possible. So our sponsors for this webinar are FCC, Weed Surfer, Enz Brothers, and McDonald. We're also very pleased to have a grant from the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is funded by the federal and Manitoba governments to support our extension activities. If you're an agronomist, you'll receive CCA credits for each webinar. At the end of the webinar, I'll have a screen where it'll have a QR code that you can scan in um, with your phone, or if you miss that, you can also email us to get that code at the end. Later today or tomorrow, you'll receive an email with a link to the recorded webinar, which you can view at your leisure as many times as you like. If you have questions that occur to you during the webinar, just type them into the question box. Um, don't raise your hand. We're actually not going to unmute you and let you ask a question verbally. We only have an hour, so we're going to keep it all the questions typed out in the question box. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. We will get to it later, and we'll send you a link to all the with answers to all the questions. So I'm now going to pass this over to um, Myra Van D, who is our moderator for today. Hi, uh, thank you. So today we're going to be talking about foxtail. Uh, so green and yellow foxtail is al also referred to as foxtail, midlet, bottle brush, bottle grass, bristle grass, pigeon grass, and wild millet. So weed by many names. Um, today, we're lucky to have Dr. Rob Golden and Ian Grossart with us to talk about management for this weed. So, um, uh, Dr. Golden is a professor at the University of Manitoba in weed ecology and management. He received a master's degree working on nitrogen fixation for the University of Manitoba a PhD focusing on volunteer canola for the University of Saskatchewan, and worked as a postdoc in corn soybean systems at the University of Guelph before joining the University of Manitoba in 2007. Rob's current research concentrates on weed and crop biology and development of weed and crop management strategies that minimize the effect of weeds on crop production while reducing reliance on pesticides. His areas of expertise include agronomy, crop production, applied crop and weed ecology, crop weed microbi or microbe interactions, and biostatistics. We also have Ian Grossert with us today. Ian runs Howe Park Farms with his wife Linda and son Zach. The farm located the farm is located in the scenic Brandon Hills and has been in Ian's family since 1879. Ian and Linda transitioned the farm to organic in 1999. They have added sensing and watering infrastructure on all fields to facilitate the integration of calf crops, of wheat, flax, and oats with their grass-finished beef operations. All fields are cycled through perennial and annual mixes that support grazing nitrogen fixation and numerous other ecosystem functions. Uh, welcome to the both of you. And I'll first ask Rob, is there anything you kind of want to add about yourself or any uh, details you wanted to add? Uh, not necessarily. I grew up on farms, um, one in Manitoba and one in Europe. So I do have a bit of a farming background as well. Um, and other than that, I've been uh, playing in the weeds world for way too long. <laughs> Great. And Ian, how about yourself? Is there anything else you wanted to add?
Oh. Sorry, I think you've mostly covered what uh, what I was going to say in my preamble. So thanks for that. Appreciate that. Perfect. Um, all right, so I'll start off by asking Rob, um, could you tell us about your research program and how Foxtail fits in? Sure. Um, this won't be too terribly long. Uh, I guess I, I mostly work in conventional systems. I leave all the organic work up to Martin Entz, um, but we do have a lot of coffee together and we certainly talk weeds when that happens. Um, and uh, and uh, how does green foxtail and yellow foxtail and, bar well, and barnyard grass, and I'll talk about all three species a little later, but uh, how does that fit into our program? Well, at the Carmen Research Station, where most of our research is, um, we do have a, uh, a herbicide resistant population of green foxtail that's becoming really complicated and difficult to manage in, in all of our research trials um, because we can't uh, manage it easily with herbicides anymore. So, even though uh, green foxtail really hasn't been a research focus across Western Canada for a long time, and I'll explain a little bit about that when we get to the biology of it, um, we do have to deal with it at the Carmen Research Farm more so than many other places do because of the herbicide resistance. Um, and so we work a lot on, uh, in all weeds, I work on integrated weed management, usually looking at uh, particularly weed crop establishment and making the crop cultural controls, making the crop most competitive, and uh, we'll cover a bit more of that as well later. So that 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 that's applicable to both organic and conventional systems. Um, also doing a fair bit of research on crop spatial arrangement lately, where we look at row spacing and plant densities, and uh, and that plays a role, going to play a role with respect to green foxtail management. I'll leave it there. Great. For now. Okay. Thanks. Um, Ian, I was just thinking. Um, if there's like anything you want to tell us about uh, your farm and how foxtail fits in and where you're located as well, actually. Yeah, we're located uh, southeast of Brandon, Manitoba, uh, which is in the western part of Manitoba, for those who aren't familiar with our province, I guess. Um, and foxtail, I guess, we certainly have some issues with it. Um, we kind of tried to build our rotation around um, dealing with different weeds, foxtail included, I guess. So we do have a um, three-year rotation with includes perennials, and then then some of our like you talked about in the intro, we go with flax, uh, and then oats, and then a then a grazed green manure year, and then back to wheat, and then back into perennials is what we have been doing, um, but. I guess our farm through the years we're we're always modifying things. So if we see things, some things don't work as well, then we'll we'll try and tweak that. But uh, so yeah, we the last couple of years we've started maybe adding some uh, more of a two-year break with some sweet clover and and having to to seed something only once every second year kind of thing instead of the cover crop year. So so yeah, we're constantly modifying things, trying to deal with the weed challenges. I guess. Great. Um, in terms of kind of a general overview of uh, foxtail, uh, Rob, can you provide an overview of green and yellow foxtail? Um, you know, what the life cycles are of these weeds and why they're a challenge in Manitoba? I can. Can we switch to my slides to just show a little bit of that? And I'm not sure who's got the power, but I don't think I do. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Now we see your screen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me, uh, I can't see it. That's the problem. <laughs> oh. Anyway. Uh, try clicking the uh, blue, the blue uh, daisy at the bottom of your screen, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to find that. Uh, there we go. And no, I think I can make that. Well, fine, because I have it on the other slide, on the other monitor. So, um, yeah, um, briefly, not sure what slide I'm on. There we go. Uh, just a quick introduction, and I'm going to go over the biology of these of these weeds. Um, sorry about that little delay. Here are pictures of the uh, the two species: green foxtails on the left, yellow foxtails on the right. Um, and how do we identify those species? I think that's the first thing we need to talk about. They're all very similar. We've got three species that look very similar. It's green foxtail, yellow foxtail, and barnyard grass. Um, and, um, but the biology is ever so slightly different. 
but it could very well be that you have all three species. The most dominant one that we typically see in Western Canada is green foxtail. That's what we usually refer to as wild millet. And that was uh, the one on the furthest to the left. So how we identify those, and I'll show them in more detail a little later in close-up pictures, is where the leaf attaches to the stem. That's where the identifying characteristics are for those three species. And um, that's really what, you know, early on in the season, what we, what we can look at. Um, they certainly look different when you look at the heads up in the picture as well. The yellow foxtail has larger seeds uh, and fewer seeds per head. Green foxtail has smaller seeds and more seeds per head. And I didn't show barnyard grass, but barnyard grass, when it heads out, has a panicle that looks like wild oats. So it looks very, very different at the heading stage. Um, and also barnyard grass looks very different as it starts to grow. It grows more sideways than straight up. Um, but that green and yellow foxtail definitely um, look very, very similar early on. The thing that we really need to look at is where the leaf attaches. <clears throat> to identify those two species. And green foxtail has um, what we call a ligule, which is this, uh, this fringe of hairs uh, right where the leaf attaches. And if I had my real screen here, I would be able to point at it with my mouse, but we'll run with, um, we'll run with what we got. And so we've got this fringe of hair there. And it also doesn't have what's called oracles, which are extensions on the leaf, um, right where the leaf attaches to the stem and they just kind of hang there loosely. Um, it's basically um, a straight line as you go up to the oracles and it has this fringe of hair there uh, and uh, as a leaky. Um, yellow foxtail uh, looks a little different. It also doesn't have um, uh, oracles. What it has though is uh, these really, really uh, sparse long hairs at the leaf base. Uh, green foxtail doesn't have that. So when you see that plant from the side, you can see all those long leaves, uh, those, sorry, those long hairs, that's yellow foxtail. And uh, it's a little tricky to tell early on because those leaves, those hairs don't show up until about the three, four leaf stage. And they're easy to see before that, the two species look very similar and that you know, can become an issue when we're trying to manage them, particularly using you know, in-crop tillage and those things, but the three, four leaf stage is probably a little bit too late. Um, barnyard grass looks a little different yet. Uh, it has no ligule and it has no oracle. So there will be no fringe of hairs or, or, or anything like that. And there will also not be any clasping structures around the leaf. And so barnyard grass looks very different right from the get-go. Um, barnyard grass also tends to have a very, very flat stem uh, and that develops very early on. Um, it's not as round in the stem as, as green foxtail and uh, yellow foxtail. So we do have these three species that look very similar. Um, I'll talk a little bit about general biology as well. Uh, and uh, what we know about green foxtail is, is that it can, it can reach the, uh, it can go from, from emergence to uh, flowering in, in a month or less. So it's like, it's like most weeds, if you, uh, if you rush them, they can still produce some seed. And, uh, and green foxtail will do that. What's important from a management perspective is that it's, it's, a, it's a C4 plant, so it's a late emerger. And we can really use that to our advantage when we try to manage this species. And it, it roots very shallow. It, it emerges very shallow, very shallow in the soil, and uh, it has a very shallow root system. That unfortunately allows it to get access to rain earlier than the crop. It also allows it to get access to nutrients that leach through the soil system before it gets to the crop. But we can certainly use that shallow rooting as a, a management advantage. Um, mature seeds don't take long to develop, a couple of weeks after flowering, seed production in the hundreds to thousands per plant, depends on how uh, much or little competition that plant endured. And then uh, there is some dormancy in the species, in, in, in all three of these species. It's not really well understood. There's some thinking that there might be a leaching inhibitor, but basically the seeds will not germinate after they seed check. And uh, that's just natural. Most weeds still have those characteristics. Steve was talking about that, about uh, uh, wild oats last week as well. And, and foxtails have that same characteristic. Um, just briefly, again, going back to emergence, which is gonna be very important from, for a management uh, perspective. Uh, the plants, the seedlings for a green foxtail, this is some data that was uh, Manitoba data from zero till conventional till systems. They germinate from very shallow in the soil. Again, we can exploit that from a management perspective. Uh, the seeds will emerge mostly from about an inch into the soil, if, la if not less. And, um, and uh, so that, that, that's very handy. There's two four species, so they, they, it takes very warm soils. Um, 
Green foxtail does best when the soil temperature is 25 to 35 degrees Celsius. That's when um, emergence or when the species decides to germinate and emerge. Uh, it certainly will do it at slightly cooler temperatures, but that's the preferred temperature range. And so they usually don't emerge until mid-May at the earliest and sometimes a bit later, depending on moisture availability in that top layer of soil. And, um, and yellow foxtail does have a slightly lower base temperature. So it actually emerges just before green foxtail does. Uh, there is a difference, and we've seen it, we see it in the greenhouse all the time as well, that the yellow foxtail will emerge a couple of days before the green foxtail first flush comes along. Um, and again, shallow depth of emergence. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. That was uh, really helpful. Um, I'll next um, maybe direct a question to Ian. Um, Ian, does foxtail pose a challenge in your system? Do you find it more or less prevalent on different areas of your farm based on differences in maybe crop types or soil types or moisture levels in localized areas? Sorry about that. It certainly poses okay. a challenge here in some years. Um, our perennial years, I mean, it's, there's not really an issue there. Um, it's in our, our couch crops years uh, with oats and, and flax and wheat. That's probably the biggest issues. Um, as Rob was saying, it generally comes up in May and June. So if you seed rye then in the fall before, then it's not really an issue in, in, uh, in those years. Um, and I guess it, it really loves a freshly harrowed field and a thunderstorm in about the middle of June. It, that seems to be optimum conditions for for getting the most emergence of your green foxtail. Great. Um, so maybe then we can just dive into some questions on dealing with foxtail. I, I think that's probably what a lot of people, a lot of the audience will be interested in. Um, I can start with a question for Rob. Um, Rob, I guess, what are your recommendations to farmers to deal with foxtail? Uh, what strategies have shown the most promise in your research? Um, that, that's a really, really good question. And I think Ian answered, got at them a little bit um, already with respect to uh, perennial crops. Crop rotation is important. I think the most important thing with, with, with managing green foxtail, if we're going to exploit its biology, is to have a fast growing cool season spring crop planted at, 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 at very at narrow row spacing and high densities. Basically, what we're trying to do to manage green foxtail and have the crop do the work is to choke it out as early as possible. And, and, and a really dense, good crop stand will accomplish that. Um, and so, you know, most of our C3 species, uh, the barleys, the wheats, the cereals that we grow, uh, will all grow green foxtail by a long shot early in the season. And if we have a good crop established, then it will it will manage that weed relatively well. You know, a tall cereal works even better, and a perennial that doesn't have any holes in the canopy also works really well. Um, what we don't want is holes in the canopy because green foxtail will exploit that later on in the season. Where the crop can't compete with it, it will certainly grow, um, and it will um, it will produce some seed, causing future problems. And of course, individual plants produce a lot of seed, so uh, we don't really want uh, a lot of seed production. Um, what else can we do? You know, uh, spring tillage works very well, of course, uh, but but again, what we want to do is establish a crop long before foxtail emerges because um, we uh, we can manage it best that way. Becomes a bit of a dilemma, right? Last week we talked about wild oats, and we heard that the best thing there to do is delay seeding. So, um, you know, it's it's always a trade-off with weeds. Uh, when we try to manage one weed, we favor others, and vice versa. Uh, but again, for green foxtail, yellow foxtail, any of those C4 species, red root pigweed, uh, early seeding, dense crop canopies work best um, to mitigate seed production. And uh, and then we can also use in-crop tillage because they come up from a very shallow depth. Uh, the in-crop tillage and, uh, and and hitting them at that white thread stage is uh, is very important um, in terms of 
management. There are many other things we can do too as well. Uh, I'll talk a little about rotations maybe later. And leave it there. Okay, great. What Ian has to say. He's the, he's the professional. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That leads right uh, to the next question. Ian, how about yourself? What strategies have you used? And what are you know some of the lessons you've learned at your farm? I guess a lot of the same strategies that Rob was just talking about, we've used um, some other things as far as um, with your crop rotation, that's why we use that where different crops the timing of seeding is, is different um, each year and and so you don't really want to see if every year seed a field on the first of May, like sometimes we want to delay that um, till the first of June, just so the you do end up get I guess getting different weeds competitive at different times. But so those are the kind of things I guess that we're we're looking at. Uh, let's look at my notes here and see what other strategies I was thinking of. Um, again, what Rob said, narrow row spacings, trying to get a, that crop up early and and yeah, seeding. If you if you have a field that you know is going to be an issue, you, you want to seed something like like you say like wheat or barley or oats that have some early competitiveness. Like to put lentils on a field that you know is going to be bad for green fox oil is just is just setting yourself up for a for a failure. So try and we try and avoid those kind of things. I'm not sure saying we get it perfect every year, but um that's that that'd be some of the strategies we use um and then yeah try and get those the seeding rates up so we get a good plant population established of the crop or crops that you're you're trying to grow um some of our lessons i guess um the blind arrowing like Rob we've done that it can work but the timing's everything like as you say you've got to get those weeds when of the white hairs but also you've got to really hope that you don't get a rain in the next two or three days or or it just just packs the soil and and just makes a better seed bed um and there's certainly other inter row tillage implements around that they would have an impact for sure on uh, on green foxtail populations as well um so i guess yeah i'm just following up on what he said like normally in this in our area June is the when green foxtail really kicks in, but we know yeah if you if you um, if you can seed earlier, it's going to help for that. But then you may not get as much wild oat control. So it almost comes down to what you know about the field that you're going into. If you know that you're going to have wild oat issues, well then you maybe have to delay seed and and deal with those. If you know it's going to be green foxtail, maybe that is a candidate to to seed at the start of May and and get some plant populations there that'll outcompete the uh, the uh, foxtail right so it sounds like a bit of a balancing act sometimes um yeah i guess um a question for both of you like are there any foxtail specific strategies you recommend or are these kind of strategies that are beneficial to deal with most warm season annual weeds I guess uh, I'll, take, I'll, I'll start with this one and then back over to Ian. Um, I, I, a lot of the strategies are going to work for green foxtail, yellow foxtail. I think are going to work very well for most um, for most uh, warm season weeds. You know, it's that early seeding crop, highly competitive crop, crop cultivar or crop crop stand, and uh, and 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 those will uh, do a good job against you know the redwood pig weeds of the world and those those weed species as well. Um, and so you know what we're trying to do, of course, is limit uh, seed seed input. Um, again, a lot of the warm season weeds will emerge from a shallow depth. So any of those in-crop techniques like tillage, inter-row or across the whole crop uh, would work um, to some degree. Timing is everything and soil moisture is everything on that front. Uh, that Ian's absolutely right on that. Uh, not that I've done much research on it. Um, I suppose that the other thing we, we can talk about a little bit is, is managing green foxtail seed at the other end of the season, which is um, um you know at harvest and uh we do know green foxtail is a little bit like wild oats it'll start dropping some seeds very early and so those are going to be difficult to deal with because they're already on the ground but the good news is is that combine hasn't spread them all over the field uh, so we can you know the patch will be contained and um and uh maybe some of the strategies that are now of interest to um to to Conventional farmers that have massive herbicide resistance problems, something like the Harrington Seed Destructor, 
which mounts on the combine and, uh, and, and, and destroys seeds going through the combine and makes them unviable. Um, for, for things like green foxtail or yellow foxtail, if we have a crop that we harvest relatively early where we can catch a lot of those seeds um, with that type of technology, then uh, we would probably get really decent control. But if we have a crop that, that you know, takes longer to mature, green foxtail will drop a lot of those seeds uh, for early in the season. Um, so so that, that's one strategy um, without going into you know, biologicals and those types of things. Right, right. Um, how about you, Ian? Oh, I guess just following up on that, um, we've used a, a chaff collector for years, so that's kind of doing the same thing. Um, and the one we have just drops the chaff row on the straw row, so then we can bale bale out off the field and and use it and and we compost all our manure, so then that deals with things that way. Um, yeah, and the and I guess if we do have a wild oats in, or a green fox in our uh, in our seed sample at the end of the combine, we screen that up, um, and then we can use that as seed for pigs and chickens, I guess. So. So there's a use for it right. that way too. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the, the, the nutritional quality of foxtail seed is just like millet. It's actually, you know, highly nutritious. Okay. Um, you've kind of led into the next question, both of you, that I wanted to ask Ian, because uh, as we know, you also produce grass-fed beef at your farm. Um, do you think the foxtail has any forage value, or maybe it's just a, you know, using the seed? Uh, for feed, um, have you ever used your cattle as a weed management strategy? Yeah, for sure we have. Um, we uh, and I guess Rob would be better to talk to how much proteins in it, but I'm but I'm sure that there's a decent amount of protein. Um, and we yeah, every year we're kind of modifying what we do. But in in the last couple of years in our alfalfa establishment year, when the alfalfa is not very big, we'll We'll take the cows, and that's when the green foxtails kind of, and other weeds are are getting a hold. And if we can get in there, not provide too much of an impact, but but do like a quick light graze across the field, um, and then it'll it's, the cows. I mean, they'll go after those really fresh green shoots ahead of the alfalfa. So, um, oh, and the okay. grasses that we have seeded. So, so that's a strategy for sure that we use with our cattle. Um, and then uh, same with the the uh, our green manure year, um, same kind of a thing that if we can get the cows in there early and clip not just the fox tail but all the weeds off, then that gives sometimes the other plants that we have seeded gives them some sunlight and um, lets them take off. So. Okay, great. Rob, is this giving you any ideas to integrate some cattle into your research program? My plots are too small. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I can only Sorry. get half a cow per plot, so no. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, an integrated system is, is a great idea. I don't, I'm, I'm not, not quite sure what the protein content of, uh, of uh, um, foxtail seed is, but it, I, I did read it's very similar to, to millet, so I'm sure it's quite nutritious. Um, and, and any of those strategies, like you say, chaff collection, same deal as the harvest seed collector, just, uh, just a different way of going about it. And uh, and then moving those through an animal system is, is excellent. And as you say, composting is great. And seed persistence of green foxtail in compost isn't too terribly long. So you don't have to pair, you don't have to uh, compost for, for for ultra long times. Um, but but it can uh, persist in compost for a little bit. It does have a really hard seed coat. Foxtail does, which is a bit unique as a grass. And it also for that reason tends to be one of the grassy weeds that tends to sit, hang around in the seed bank a little longer than than say a wild oat milk. So there are some differences there with, uh, with other grassy weeds. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I also want to reach out to the audience and let you know that um, if you have questions that are coming to mind, uh, feel free to reach out. We have some more questions prepared for Ian and Rob but uh, I'll be keeping an eye on your questions that you submit as well. So I'll kind of uh, start with some open-ended questions kind of just directed to the both of you. Uh, the first, uh, which you've both uh, already touched on a bit, but we hear a lot about, you know, the benefits, um, you know, of crop diversity and crop rotation. Uh, could you maybe just highlight how 
uh, diversity is like it enables the management of foxtail. You want to take that one first, Ian? Oh, I was hoping you would. Um, I guess, in one hand, it can actually be lead to more of a challenge because, as we find, like we're we're trying to do multi-species cover crops and even um, adding some things with our grain crops. So then, if you have little clovers and stuff as well, like you do blind harrowing, well, then you're going to take some of that out. So sometimes, yeah, when you have a monoculture it is easier to to control some of these things but on the flip side it's not nearly as healthy for the soil so there's a there's kind of a, a two-way rub there i guess so that uh, yeah i mean and the same token with the conventional guys if you have um if you have some small seeded grasses in the bottom and then you want to go and spray with whatever it's going to take your melon out it's also going to take your little grasses out as well so it's uh, yeah, it, it can be a challenge in when you're wanting to set up a diverse system and uh, it's, it's all, all our tools are more, more designed for for non diverse systems, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, on the, on the rotation, we did a, a rotation study a few years ago. Um, I think it ended in 2014, mostly looking at wild oat management in canola. And uh, the funny thing was that our, at our location, it was all across Western Canada, our location that Carmen had so much free foxtail in it, we actually measured that as well. Um, so we, have, we do have a you know, five-year crop sequence study. There's 14 different rotations in that study from the simplest of conventional rotations, which was wheat canola, wheat canola, um, and, uh, and down right to uh, canola, three years of alfalfa, alpha, followed by canola, um, and everything else in between. And what we ended up, you know, what looked like some of the most effective treatments were, um, there were some of the fall seeded cereals, um, that were seeded at double the seeding rate. And, and this was a study that had limited herbicide um, applications because we just find that doing some of this crop rotation work, um, giving, giving the weeds the full dose of herbicide really doesn't show the crop effect very well. So it was reduced herbicide rates so over the you know, semi-organic system. Um, and, and it really showed that, that anytime we have a highly competitive crop, um, in the previous season, and we have something like a, a fall cereal, or sometimes even a, a cereal that gets cut for silage. When we limit seed bank input, then the populations the next year tend to be much, much lower. Um, and it's all it's all about seed bank input in terms of long-term management. And so, whatever crops are going to accomplish that, uh, they're going to be a very good tool for, for for doing that for green fox cell. And as as Ian was saying, you know, a, a low-growing crop like lentil or anything like that. When you already have a problem or think you might have a problem, it's probably not the best strategy. Or if that becomes an issue, then the follow up crop should be a really, really competitive crop in which you can manage this weed um, uh, as best as possible. And so the alfalfa actually didn't do all that great in that study, the three years of alfalfa. And I think it was because by the third year, we had enough winter kill that there were, um, there were some pockets in that stand. And green foxtail was able to replenish the seed bank in that. So it's all it's all about having a very solid stand across the field. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like Ian, is that something you've ever experienced? Like have you, you know, gone in with a plan and then kind of modified based on the the situation? Well, that's that's farming every year. There's always a plan and then there's <laughs> things we get more like we have found, um, like, yeah, we never used just solid alfalfa in our, our rotation. It was always with the grasses. And in the last few years, we just added more things, putting in hairy vetch. And, um, and, and even in the, the first year, we'll put in some, some annuals just to get a better ground cover of the, some of the things we want. Um, and then, uh, then hopefully alfalfa will kind of stay for a few years. And I guess, um, but it has, like, other grasses and stuff we use timothy or brome or meadow brome those kind of things as well as a mix because that's the other thing you can get areas of the field that like say it drowns out the alfalfa but you still got the some of the grasses that you want so so that can be right. be a strategy too just yeah don't just pick one crop i guess and for us in those years a diverse mix and then something will, something will be there that hopefully that something that we want right definitely um, we have um, a question from the audience about thresholds. 
Um, Andrew asks, what is the threshold level of green or yellow foxtail before it starts to impact on cash crop yield? And which crops are impacted the most by infestations of foxtail? Brilliant question. So that's my next slide. Um, uh, can I, is my, are my slides still showing? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, okay. How's you're that? on the seed biology is the one you're on right now on my screen. Oh, okay. there you go. Oh, sorry, that's the one? Yeah. That's the one yeah. you lost. Right. Oh. Well, so, so this is out of the, uh, this is out of the guide to, uh, to crop protection and, and there's some useful threshold tools in there. And um, we certainly know the threshold for green foxtail. And um, uh, certainly, well, we know it in wheat and barley, um, maybe less competitive crops, not so. But, uh, but really what the gist of it is, is that, that wheat and barley are really competitive and you're gonna need some really high densities of foxtail to have an impact on yield. Um, and we also have these decision-making trees for foxtail uh, because it's a C4 plant. And oftentimes, while well, wheat and barley are C3 plants, we also have to look at the weather. Uh, whether it's worth managing it or not. So if you look at that slide, it tells you on top that uh, the decision tree is all your green foxtail density less than 100 uh, per square meter or 10 per square foot. Um, what do you do? Uh, if, it, if it's lower, then you don't really even worry about it. If it's higher, then you need to think about uh, what the weather is going to do over the next little while. And if the weather is conducive for the C3 plant, the crop to do well, i.e. it's cool and wet, then you don't really need to worry too terribly much. And if it becomes hot and dry, then you know, these densities uh, become an issue. But the threshold is quite high. So if you look for wheat, the threshold, and usually we use a 5% yield loss threshold, you need 100 plants per meter squared or 10 per square foot. And if you get into barley, to get 100, uh, to get 5% uh, yield loss, you need 175 green foxtail plants per square meter or, or almost 20 per square foot. So, while it is the most abundant weed in all our weed surveys in Western Canada and has been in organic and conventional settings for the last 40 years, uh, mostly because of the later merger, its impact on yield actually hasn't been that much. But it's that seed return that you want to be uh, concerned about for future rotations and depending on what kind of crop you grow in the future. Now, if it's something like flax, that's not very competitive. Um, you know, we can, we can talk a little bit about Martin's, uh, Martin Ence's system with the roll day roller and how to manage that without tillage um, and, and grow a fantastic flax crop without green foxtail issues. But, uh, but if it's a, a, a crop that's not competitive, you want to make sure that you don't get a lot of seed return. Right, definitely. Um, Ian, do you have anything to add on that note? Not, not as far as the yield loss is concerned. I, that, I guess just when Rob was talking about that, um, um, Martin Enns' work with the the roller and stuff, that's probably the biggest strategy that, and when we used to be um, conventional, we were doing a lot more zero till. So, I mean, that certainly impacts if you can direct seed and you're not stirring up that soil surface. So, I mean, a lot of our, those of us in the, um, Organic world, like that, would be the the uh, kind of the holy grail of things if we could figure out how to do this organic thing uh, with the zero till uh, mixed in. That would um, and, and a little more effective than than uh, than we have to this point, I guess. Right. That um, kind of leads into like another question, like how do you balance the trade off? of soil health and tillage for weed control, like especially in an organic system where, you know, you're probably trying to prioritize soil health, but then you also have to manage weeds as well. Yeah, that's the $64 question. And I mean, and that's, I think I'll spend the rest of my farming career trying to figure that out because there is a delicate balance there because we are for sure trying to improve our soil health. And, uh, but at the same time, yeah, if uh, if weeds are prevalent, then you, you still have to make a dollar each year too, it seems that it's a, you need something to live on. So, so yeah, it is a delicate balancing act. And I guess the, just even with tillage, if we can, that's, I guess, one of the reasons why we don't summer fall per se, we always have something green or animals on there. Um, and if you can get, uh, yeah, if you, cultivate something in then put 
look we're something up and then put rye or something in the pulse you've always got a green plant covering that portion of soil building off and and hopefully yeah hopefully we'll we, we can kind of go two steps forward and one step back with our tillage i guess would be the be our end goal here yeah for sure um rob what are your thoughts so it's, it's a real challenge, right? I mean, our, our 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 production systems with the kind of crops we grow rely on a disturbance, and if we don't do it with a piece of tillage equipment, we do it with a herbicide. But we have to keep disturbing things so that we can grow the crops we can grow and manage the weeds that are very similar to crops. I mean, they they take they have the same life cycle, um, uh, and so uh, so yeah, there there is this big trade off. Um, what I do want to add to this, though, is that um, I think we're kind of, I saw that at the Manitoba Agronomist Conference last year, too, is, is uh, I think our extension efforts have sort of painted all tillage as, as evil. Um, and, and there certainly are differences among the type of tillage operations we do and how good or bad they might be for soil, uh, for soil health, right? I mean, if you, if you pull out a mobile flower and flip the whole thing upside down, um, that's a different type of tillage pass than if you do an in-crop harrowing uh, early in the season that, that, that goes to a depth of half an inch or an inch to manage green foxtail. And so I'd say, you know, some of those in-crop tillage passes, I wouldn't really call them as, as, as overly detrimental to soil health. Um, but some of those, you know, inversion passes that we do need to do, it's very difficult to farm without them uh, in, in all systems. Um, they certainly have an impact on soil health, but if we're incorporating a green manure, you know, there is a trade-off again. Well, you need to incorporate that. How do we do it best? And you know, it, yeah, as Ian said earlier, farming is a trade-off. Um, every decision comes Great. with consequences. But, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to stress that not every tillage pass has the same effect on soil health, and, and I think we need to start rethinking tillage. Great. Yeah, on that note then, like what are your favorites or like, you know, most successful implements and timing of use for managing foxtail? Kind of to either one of you. Well, I mean, I, I, I can just briefly speak to most of the work that we've done is I, I've not done a lot of, uh, you know, in-crop tillage work and those types of things. Martin does most of that and Steve Shirtlip has done a lot of that work uh, in Saskatoon. So uh, for us, for, for me, the most important tool is, is that crop establishment side of things that then will minimize how many intervention passes we would need to do after, after the fact. So, so crop establishment is still critical. Um, I'll, I'll maybe mention something about, you know, bi biological control was, was worked on for a while. Um, in Saskatoon, when they still had a program there, they, had, uh, they were looking at green fox cell specific microbes to um, to manage that weed, uh, turns out they didn't work out too well, and, it, and that, that was never commercialized. But uh, but keeping the seeds on the surface, as Ian was saying earlier, uh, green fox cell seeds are really tasty to, to insects and to rodents and those types of things. So if we have some seeds on the surface, and, and usually predation is highest when you have, leave the seeds on the surface. So delaying tillage passes in the fall, uh, the seeds are very unlikely to germinate unless we have really warm conditions because it's a warm season species. It's not going to be inclined to germinate in the fall. Um, leaving those seeds on the surface so that we can maximize predation and having residue on the surface because all those predators like residue more than bare soil um, is another way to put down some of those populations. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, in-crop tillage, I'll let, I'll let Ian speak to, to some of those things and, and the things that he prefers. Well, I think I'm like Rob too. Like you, you want to establish that crop and get it competitive because anything after that, you're just kind of putting on band-aids. I mean, there's, um, it, it all comes down to like really our only in-crop tool we have is a harrow. Um, there's other things out there that we haven't invested in, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it is important to get the crop established. At, again, like we said before, with narrow row spacing and 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 higher seeding rates so that you've got a good established crop to outcompete this because yeah once you start in crops up i mean there's the interval cultivators they certainly have some um have a place but but again like i said we don't have one but um but you're still you're still chasing then if you can get that crop established and get some canopy above the weeds then then you're getting ahead of them 
Definitely. Yeah. One of the best examples for that uh, the, the, the team was many years ago when we were working on inside resistant green foxtail that was when the U of M still had a produce research station. It was a really good canola growing year and we, we wanted to do this trial and we had foxtail in there and it came up fantastic. The huge foxtail population in, in, in the canola and then that canola cabbaged out. And by mid-July, you could look into that canola crop and there wasn't a single live foxtail plant there anymore. It had completely choked out the entire pop. And, and there were hundreds of plants per meter squared. I mean, we were so happy for the foxtail and then the whole thing failed because the crop completely outgrew it. That was a great success on cultural weed control. Great. Um, yeah, I just uh, reach out to the audience. Like, feel free to send any questions in for uh, Ian and Rob. They're here to, um, you know, help you and share their knowledge. Um, oh, and I just got another question. Um, Andrew asks, uh, when using no-till, min minimum till systems in the UK on heavy clay soils, we still had to use flat lifts, subsoils, et cetera, to bring subsoil compaction, or sorry, to break subsoil compaction, but not disturb the surface. Does Ian have to use any deep cultivation tools or is compaction not a problem? Generally, we don't, um, yeah, we don't, haven't ever used any subsoiling. Um, we certainly have heavy clay soils here, but I guess the, um, I think the years of alfalfa, those roots, they're helping us with compaction. Um, we don't have we don't have huge compaction layers here. We uh, we've been kind of following that the last few years, and um, so yeah, that's not a not a huge issue for us, I guess. Um, and Ian, you said you do three. You have alfalfa for three years in the rotation, right? Yeah, generally, it all depends on the field too. Like if some of our ones that we think are a little lower fertility and need some more soil building, we'll leave the, the alfalfa in longer and, and end up grazing those areas intensely more often. And that that's a strategy too. I've got a field this year that was in flax and and it's kind of been part of a couple different rotations. It was a small field, but there's there's different parts of it have had different Sorry, Ian, I think your audio cut out. Or, Rob, do you still hear Ian? No, no, I, uh, I lost him about halfway through that sentence. Okay, well, um, give it a second then maybe. Yeah, I think we're hey, having some the, audio challenges. Um, with as far as the rotation yeah. and, and soil building. Oh, sorry, Ian, we lost your audio for a second. Would you mind repeating your, your last bit there? Okay. Where, what did you hear, I guess? Um, uh, we were at, uh, you said that, like, uh, you sometimes leave in the alfalfa longer and you might graze it. Um, and then, yeah, then we, we lost you. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry. So, yeah, we sometimes leave alfalfa. Are my cutting it again? No, no, you're good. You're good. Keep going. Um, so yeah, sometimes we leave alfalfa in a little longer, try and do some soil building on on those kind of fields. Um, and also we, yeah, we've got one field that was flax this year that we kind of did, have done some of the soil building on one half of the field and not on the other. And there was a distinct line where, where what I would say was more improved soil on the one part of the field. Um, there was just very little weed competition and right beside it where we haven't spent as much time with animal impact. Um, and there's just, yeah, it's, like I say, you can, I've got pictures of it and, and there's just a line in the field where there's way more weed competition for whatever reason. I guess we need to do some soil tests to just figure out what we've done on the one side that we haven't done on the other. But. Hmm, that's really interesting. Yeah, Rob, did you have anything to add about uh, in terms of compaction? No, well, yeah, I'm not a soil scientist, but certainly, um, you know, uh, there are compaction issues in, in Western Canada, but I, I grew up on a farm in Europe as well, and so I, so I sort of understand yeah, the compaction issues, issues in Europe. Um, I think 
what is different in, in Western Canada versus Europe, and, and I've never seen a really good explanation for that, but in, in Western Canada, we have these you know, heavy freeze thaw cycles once a year, where the soil freezes rock solid, and when water freezes, it expands, right? And, and so it, to me, I think has some impact on, on how, uh, how, 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 how quickly we build soil compaction, and maybe this is why we have not quite the same level of compaction issues as, as they do in Europe. There might be a whole suite of other reasons for that as well. You know, equipment width and, 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 and tire tread, um, you know, density, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but there certainly are tools that can be used that, that, that you know, have minimum soil disturbance and, and, and will uh, break up that compaction layer. And they exist here, here as well, for sure. That's a, that's a good question. And it is a, it is real, it is a real issue. Hmm. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Stuart asks, I've been using a 12-inch spacing cedar and found that fox sale has been increasing. Are there any suggestions on row spacing to maximize inter-row competition of foxtail? Oh, I need to go through further into my slideshow, do I? <laughs> That's Stuart McMillan? Yes, it is. Hey, Stuart, how's it going? Um, I've got some slides on this to, just to show you because it, there's a there's a here's the picture I always show my uh, my class. Can you see that all? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so the the row spacing study here that that you see is a 15 inch row spacing in wheat that we're using um, these days, and uh, it's not ideal for wheat production. The one behind it is seven and a half. And what we're actually doing with the seven and a half is um, We've decided in the last couple of years that we're going to double past that um, and and reduce that row spacing down in three and three quarters. But so you got that uh, that that thinking in my mind. It, go, it goes back to this picture here, and this picture is from uh, you know the Manitoba Department of Agriculture and Immigration, right? So this is when the two departments were still one back uh, when uh, you know a lot of the immigrants were going to be farmers, and this is the early probably the early 50s when 24D first came out. And, uh, you know, I always show this picture in my weeds class for two reasons. Number one, how wonderful 2,4-D works against wild mustard and why it wasn't very difficult to convince people that this is magic. And number two, the crop establishment in the row spacing. Look at those rows. I don't know what that spacing is, but that's six inches or less. Those are snug rows and that's a well-established canopy. And so, um, you know, 15s by no won't close. 12 inch rows in a, in, a, in a dry year probably won't close either. Um, for example, here's our 15 inch row spacing study with high and low densities. You can see uh, that even at the highest seeding densities of wheat here, we still see some light getting into that, into that between those rows. Um, and if you get down to seven and a half, which is the top panel here, and you get down then to the three and three, three and three quarters at, uh, and these are 400 seeds per meter. That three and three quarters closes up very nicely by the middle of June. Uh, and if you have an understory green foxtail plant in there, it's it's not going to do well. Okay. So I guess kind of minimizing the spacing as much as as much as you can for that crop. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I'd say, you know, um, you know those, 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 those row spacings, I understand why we've gone to wider row spacing. There's a lot of economic reasons for that. Um, but I would also make the argument that a number of our herbicide resistance problems are because of how we establish our crops. And um, I, think we, I think there's room for improvement there. And, uh, and if you're going to manage, if you're going to make the crop do the work, we have to set up the crop to be able to do the work. And the crops can do the work against those leaves. So we just have to set them up. So, so yeah, seven inch spacing is quite good, but we find that if you go even more narrow, there might even some benefits to be gained from that. Um, so that's, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, cedar is a big investment and you do that once in a while, you don't buy a new cedar every year. So those are, those are, those are trade-offs again and decisions that every producer has to make and what works into their, in their system. And it's not an easy decision. Yeah, Ian, I, uh, I guess you would agree. Yeah, I would. Um, the, I think the narrower the better, but it, like Rob says, you don't trade your drills every year. And um, 
I think it's yeah, and, and it's a trade off for some guys too because I think intro on the seven inch, but if you get down to three point seven five, you're likely not going to do an intro. But but again, you probably wouldn't have to there because you're going to get enough competition. So um, it, that's kind of what we're looking towards down the road. We certainly won't go wider row spacing than what we have. I don't think. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have a question about cover crops, which we haven't touched too much on yet. Um, class, I apologize, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, asks, which cover crop do you recommend after seeding wheat to destroy foxtail seeds? I have no idea. Any, any thoughts here? <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know. If, I don't think any cover crop is going to destroy the seeds, but um, like just, I mean, the more every year we kind of add a different crop into our cover crop mix. So we're using things like vetch and um, we'll do rye, Italian rye, um, some peas, just as many different Like if you want to throw some wheat and oats in that mix as well. Um, just anything to keep the kind of get a good crop established in a cover crop year. But I mean, I guess there's two ways of looking at that. Do you want to put some some things that aren't as competitive so that you'll the growth of your your um, green foxtail and then be able to take it out with cattle or tillage? There's I guess there's that aspect of it too. But. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. I mean, you know, there, there's certainly some cover crops like rye that have some allelopathic properties and and stop the seed from germinating. Um, but sometimes you actually want the seed to germinate just to get it out of the seed bank if you know the crop is going to be competitive and, and, and doesn't that that germination event doesn't lead to more seed returns. Um, but uh, I think the general principle is 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 have a thick dense crop canopy no matter what it is and uh, it should be in good shape. Great. Yeah, I think we have um, kind of just a minute or two left. I think I'll ask you both if there's any kind of last bits of wisdom or, um, you know, lessons learned you want to share with the audience, anything we didn't touch on yet that uh, that you'd like to share? I don't know. The last few years have been really good green foxtail years. I'm certainly yeah. more of from Carmen all the way into the west into the Red River Valley. Uh, foxtail is has been it's been a real challenge. Um, even in the conventional systems I work in because it's just been so hot and dry. Uh, and if we didn't get the crop in the ground early, it just never turned into a really competitive stand. And so that's been been a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd agree. Like we. This year was was a challenge just because we couldn't we were so wet from the fall of nineteen that we couldn't get on fields early this year and so we were kind of got backed up. So then yeah we were seeding a lot of stuff near the end of May and early June and just prime time for green foxtail to want to emerge. So which in some cases it certainly did. Right. All right, well, I think it's nearly time for me to hand things back over to Moa, but I wanted to thank both you, uh, Rob and Ian, so much for taking your time and sharing your stories. I know we all really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to thank the audience as well for participating and sending in some great questions. And uh, thank you to Moa for organizing this webinar. And uh, I'll hand things over to Karen. Great, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for for all of your great advice around uh, managing foxtail. So I just wanted to thank our sponsors again. Uh, we had for this ep um, webinar, we had Weed Surfer, FCC, McDonough and Enns Brothers. So thank you very much for sponsoring this webinar. Um, thanks to all of the team who helped put all of these webinars together. Um, we will be sending out a, a link to the video recording of this uh, so you can watch it later. And I think we got to all the questions, but if there's any, um, if there were any other unanswered ones, we'll be adding those um, answers as well. And also I received a nice little PowerPoint or a PDF, a uh, couple of slides from Martin Enns earlier that would help 
um, just give some additional weed control issues. So I'm going to be posting that on our website. So go ahead and check it out on manitobaorganicalliance.com and you'll find some more resources there. So don't forget next week is our last um, in our series of five weed webinars and we're gonna be tackling Canada thistle. Um, so please join us next week and thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day.